hey everyone! Welcome to episode 359 of F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week on the podcast, I'm very excited to bring you a chat that I had with Tim Jeffreyon. Tim is known as This Walking Life on Instagram, and most notably, in 2019, he set off on a journey to visit and f- photograph all of the national parks in the United States. In this episode, we unpack the impetus of Tim's inspiring adventure and delve into the profound impacts the journey had on his life and photography. Before we dive in, I have to take a second to thank our latest supporter on Patreon, Jim Lockheed. Jim joins an amazing group of kind folks who are financially supporting this show. It's easy if you want to help out too. Just go to patreon.com forward slash f-stop and listen. After you sign up, depending on the tier you choose, you'll have access to bonus episodes, early access to episodes, and one-to-one access of my time if you if you should ever want that. Thanks for all the amazing people helping keep the show going. All right, let's get to this week's episode with Tim Jeffreyon. All right, Tim Jeffreyon, it's great to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I believe listener Laura Zarino recommended you and you, she kind of helped bridge the gap to help create, uh, you know, some synergy around getting you on the show. So I'm really happy to do this. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fun to be on. Awesome, man. Well, for people who don't know who you are, let's just kick it off and have you introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm sure nobody knows who I am. <laughs> That's Clean awesome, slate. though. <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Tim Jeffreyon. I live down in uh, Austin, Texas right now and um, do a lot of landscape photography. Um, but I think probably what we should be talking about today is a few years ago, I had this big life transition moment and ended up traveling to all the national parks and photographing all the uh, national parks in America, which I had been doing a lot of photography before then, but really, you know, that was a two-year graduate school program in, in photography for me and really changed the course of my life. So excited to talk about it with you today. Sweet. And uh, what do you do now? Are you still doing photography full-time? Or are you are you doing it on the side? What's your status there? So my wife and I had our first child in April, and that has uh, limited the amount of photography of the natural natural world that I can do anymore. I take plenty of photographs of our daughter, but uh, there's been a little bit of a pause on the amount of time I've had, you know, behind the camera. Um, My full-time work now is I do a lot of uh, coaching, uh, both with individuals and in the corporate context. Um, We can talk about that more later. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. Well, I feel like we've got quite a lot to unpack uh, for this particular podcast. Of course, starting with your journey, like you said, starting in 2019, through all of the United States National Parks. Uh, What prompted this journey? And real quick, how many national parks are there? (laughs) I don't even know. Yeah, there's 63 now. When I started the journey, there were 59. Okay. Um, So from time to time, you know, through an act of Congress, well, you know, the, the U.S. will add to the list. Right. Um, I held myself responsible to the original 59, though I've, I've gotten to 62 of them now. So saving, the, saving one last one for the future. Yeah. But my journey, I, I can trace it back, you know, in a bunch of different ways. But I think probably the place to, to start is in January of 2019. I had found myself at that point in my life just not knowing where to go or not not knowing what to do. I don't know if you've ever been in a moment like that in your life where I'd been working really hard. Um, I'd gone to college, went into this business career kind of on a lark. Um, But then, you know, after more than a decade in that career, really found myself invested in the career, but not particularly enjoying it, but feeling a ton of pressure to succeed in it. I, um, had met my my wife when I was I think eighteen or nineteen years old. We got engaged when we were twenty three, um, and by that point, life had kind of taken us in in different directions. She was getting a a PhD in one city, and I was on the other side of the country trying to pursue my career, and we were slowly drifting apart. And uh, you know that had been going on for 
for two or three years, I remember taking this job and just every day dreading going into the office and then on the weekends having these unbelievably big expanses of time because my wife was in a different city. Oh, right. Yeah. And trying to figure out like, what am I supposed to do with this? What am I supposed to do with this time? And that's kind of when I discovered photography. And I know this is a long lead up into how did the, the journey start, but it was when I discovered photography and there was a very small, I grew up in, in Minnesota and I'd moved back to Minnesota for this job. And there was this very small, just several acre old growth forest that had kind of survived the suburbia madness, you know, that was everywhere else. And I found myself going back to this small old growth forest every single weekend. You know, at first it was just to walk because I sort of felt a sense of peace under these huge maple trees. Right. Yeah. And then later I started bringing a, a, my iPhone and trying to capture them. And then I wasn't satisfied with them. And my mom does a ton of photography and um, she gave me you know, her DSLR. And then I was trying to capture these trees or say something about the trees with this DSLR. And I didn't know what I was doing. And so then I, you know online courses and blogs and experimenting and you know by by January of 2019 I was often coming late to work because I would stop at the old growth forest first because I wanted to capture the light coming through the trees um, <laughs> nice. which yeah. just was not in sync with being you know in a financial job where everyone is money 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 all the time and right. so there was just this huge disconnect that was happening in my life mm -hmm. and um so we got to the to the new year, and uh, my wife and I had been sort of separated two years at that point. And you know, I think it was a, a Tuesday morning or something. I'd sent her this text saying, "You know, we we need to talk. Like this is not this is not working." And then Tuesday evening, I got a an email from my boss saying, "Hey, can you come in early tomorrow uh -oh. morning?" Which is never the thing you want to. <laughs> No, like, from your <laughs> boss, right? Yeah, it's never, and, never uh, so I came in early. Came in early in the morning, and um, I had just gotten promoted two months before this, so I was really committed to my career at this point, despite the fact that I wasn't really enjoying it. And he sort of sat me down, and he said, "I don't think you're enjoying yourself." And then he used this silly boat metaphor, and he said, that, "You know, we really need to all be rowing in the same direction." And I feel <laughs> oh, like no. you don't want to. I feel like you don't want to row with us. And uh. I don't know why, but I decided to be honest in that moment. And I just like before I knew what I was saying, I was like, "You're right." <laughs> and then I was like, "Oh my God, what have I done?" <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just fired myself. I just fired myself. Yeah, and so you know, then I, you know. Fast forward, you know, a few minutes later, I'm riding the elevator down with like a box of stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I? What am I doing? <laughs> and he was very sweet. You know, there was this long period and it wasn't a bad, a bad end. He said I could stay as long as I wanted. But it was clear to both of us at that moment, like, what are you doing here? Yeah. Um, and so I had this freedom suddenly to do anything I wanted. And so I, I called my mom up and I said, hey, mom, do you want to have lunch? <laughs> She was like, what do you mean? I haven't had lunch with you ever since you were a kid. So I had lunch with her and she, um, she's, I told her and she said, well, I'm taking your grandmother to this appointment tomorrow. Do you want to come to this appointment with us? And I said, sure, I've got nothing else to do. You know, I said, just don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone that I've left my job. Um, so I go to this, I go to this appointment with my, with my grandmother. We were very close. I grew up next door. To my grandmother we had a very tight family uncles and aunts sunday dinner you know all the things and um you know it's supposed to be kind of a routine procedure and you know an hour or two later it was clear she was going to hospice and she probably oh. only had a week left to live and so you know in the course of two or three days i had sort of made this decision that i needed to end the marriage i had <laughs> fired myself effectively and I was just sort of staring at mortality um, and the loss of my grandmother, who'd been this very connecting and important force you know, in my life. And, uh, you know, I had no freaking idea what to do with myself yeah. on the other side of this. And I kind of went into just an unbelievable depression mm. and a funk after that, as you can imagine. And I was catching up with a friend after this. Um, her name's Steph Chang. And I, at this time, I felt all this pressure to, to still be like organized in my narrative and to 
preserve the opportunity of staying in the industry. And so like, I still wasn't even telling anyone that I'd been let go. This was still like a secret you know, that I was keeping, which is hysterical in retrospect. <laughs> but so I had, I had like tried to like go, I'd spent, you know, four hours uh, with this dear old friend and never told her that I was being let go, but she could tell I was miserable. And so she just, just kind of did this coaching move on me and she said, hey, just stop. Like, I can just tell you're not happy. Just stop for a second. Answer me one question. If you knew you were going to die in three years, what would you do right now? And then I started to, like, pontificate or think, and she was like, stop. No thinking. <laughs> what would you do right now? <laughs> and, like, it just sort of came out of me. Like, I'd go to the mountains. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, I guess I know what I want to I guess I know what I want to do. Right. Yeah, and I realized yeah. it was so clear. Um, and so it, it took me another month to kind of like organize on what does that mean and convince myself that I wasn't making the worst life choice or, you know, <laughs> that I had enough in savings to be able to go live in the mountains. And uh, I mean, ended that... up heading out to Colorado and just exploring the mountains. And I, I had no intention at that point of seeing all the national parks. My only goal was get out of your head, get out of your apartment. Don't be this person that you were that has all these stories that I'm attaching to myself and I feel other people are attaching to me and just go be in the mountains and bring your camera. That was kind of like the whole vision at that point. And I didn't know if that was going to last a week or if it was going to last a month. And, you know, it, wow. that ended up taking two years and taking me to all sorts of different places. Yeah, I mean, there's so many directions we can go here. I mean, I th I feel like the practical side of me has all these questions in terms of, like, how much money did you have saved up? Or have you ever spent that much time in the mountains? Or how did you survive in terms of, you know, were you camping? Were you staying in hotels? Like, what was your... Maybe talk a little bit about some of those aspects real quick. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a bunch of different a bunch of different pieces to that. One, I think early on my journey I wanted to like democratize the way that I spoke about things to be like I'm just one of you. But like the truth was I I worked in this very lucrative field for 10 years and and I grew up in a Midwestern family that didn't believe in spending money. Okay. <laughs> so, I just saved, 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 saved for 10 years. Gotcha. Um, I mean, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but like even when I when I moved back, I took this job and it was very well paid. I decided that I would move in with my parents <laughs> at 29. Yeah. <laughs> because I thought like my wife is in a different city, like what do I need my own apartment? here for anyways i'll just save on rent you know and so yeah. you know i just i had saved a, a boatload of money um over that time and that that, that was good and, and bad uh, it wasn't like i never had to work ever again but it certainly gave me like a year to be able to do this journey in the way that i wanted Right. to do it without the pressure right. on that. And when I started, I mean, I think one of the things that's funny is I had never been a, in a tent before. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is the part <laughs> I was curious about. <laughs> yeah, I think this is, you know, I really wanted to be, like, I perceived myself as being outdoorsy, but of course I'd never been in a tent, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and so it led to this, I think, very funny moment early on, which is, uh, so I get, to I get to Colorado, I'm ready to explore the mountains, and I go to REI. Um, there's like an REI in Denver somewhere. And so I go to the REI, and, you know, I, I came from an industry where you wanted to look really smart all the time oh no you know, whether you knew anything or not it didn't matter like you had to project smart so i remember like standing around the tents and like having some guy come over and be like hey can i help you and initially my response would be like no i got it all right i know what i'm doing you know and then still standing there like 30 minutes later and he like comes back and he's like you sure you don't need help i'm like yeah actually i, I do i'm i'm gonna be car camping and just looking for a really good setup and <laughs> anyways it, we went back and forth with this and then I realized he wasn't that helpful, which was very confused too. It turned out he had just been hired. Oh no! <laughs> to REI the day before, so like the two of us are like standing there, like idiots, like reading the back of these boxes and like kind of <laughs> trying to 
figure out like is this a good tent for us is this not a good tent we have no idea he has to end up like calling his manager that comes over you know and then it's like lecturing both of us on tents and i think i've escaped the experience and then the manager says well we finally pick one he's like don't you want to set it up and i was like it was like no i'm good he was like well i won't be here to help you set it up right <laughs> when you use it so you should probably try to set it up in the store and so taking it out of the box and trying to set it up and I can't figure out like where anything's supposed to go and it's yeah. just humiliating and there's people like now around us like watching as if this is a, a midday show at the REI and so uh, I, I there was this like a wonderful lesson in humility that I got sort of day one of the journey just you, you got to give up the pretense if you want to have the the journey that you want to have and I think that really carried over into photography too where um, and we can talk about this later too. I mean, I had no no idea what I was doing mm. photographically. Um, I just had this like strong urge inside of me that I was seeing these really beautiful things, and I really wanted to share that with other people. And I kind of had to decide just like how much of a beginner and how much was I willing to experiment and fall flat on my face. You know, was I willing to do? And sometimes I would fight that, and then sometimes I would lean fully into it and that's when i'd have these big moments of growth i feel like that sentence you just said has so much it's so profound i mean you got to give up the pretense if you want to go on the journey that you want to have and that can apply to so many different avenues of life but of course it applies very specifically to photography as well i mean in terms of even if you're a full-time professional there's so much more you can learn from others and you know if you're just willing to be open and receiving of that information and have that curiosity and that willingness to to you know set aside your ego for a second um it, it opens up a lot of doors yeah and i think it was really hard for me early on i'm sure we can talk a lot about instagram you know and all the <laughs> wonderful and terrible things about instagram you know i got on instagram and 2014 or 2015 and I feel like at that point there was no reels there was no videos right. I think it was chronological I don't remember when that shifted so it was a very different platform at that point oh, um, yeah. I don't think hashtags existed maybe they did and I just didn't know about them I don't know right. they, maybe they don't even exist anymore I'm not sure but it was a very different platform at that point but I, I remember there was this tension that I felt at, at various points right to like I wanted people to like my photographs. <laughs> I really course. wanted to be affirmed, you know, and like that really gets in the way of being a beginner and opening yourself up and just having the experiences and being sloppy. And um, hmm. yeah, I'm sure we could talk a lot about that. About yeah, that let's, later let's too. I mean, gosh, let's not shy away from that particular um, talking point because I feel like there's a lot of value in talking about how that chase for likes and validation can oftentimes be one of the main things getting in our way. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely felt that. I, I think I got lucky before I started this journey. I'd read a lot of this author named Teju Cole. I don't know if you've mm -mm. come across that name before. And his photography style is you know, very different than anything you see on Instagram. He's not a landscape photographer. He's sort of he's a public intellectual. He's written a bunch of you know books of like literary criticism. He's sort of written a, a, a memoir. Um, I forget if he's a professor at NYU or where he is now. But he had an Instagram for a long time, and his Instagram was like him walking around New York City taking a picture of a statue. You know, that's like not composed. It's like, hey, I'm walking by. Here's a picture. <laughs> You're like, what? And yet somehow there ends up being a lot of artistry in it, despite mm. the fact that it, it appears that there's no time at all that he's spent on any of these compositions. And for whatever reason, when I joined Instagram, I followed like five accounts, you know, because I wasn't I didn't I didn't identify as a landscape photographer mm -hmm. um, at that point. I, read his book i liked his book i followed him and so i sort of had that as a mindset of photography which is just capture interesting things as you come across them versus capture the perfect image or spend a bunch of time on photoshop i think i felt those pressures later but i didn't 
mm. as my initial entree into photography. Mm -hmm. And then he had sort of collected this group of thousands of people around him, you know, that did photography the same way. I mean, that's one of the interesting things about Instagram, right? Like tribes can form around right. random individuals. And so, you know, I, I, early on in my Instagram, I think I like put some comments, you know, on his photographs or whatever, like, wow, beautiful image or something. And before you know it, like some random person in Pakistan is following you. Right. And then, you know, like at this point, I didn't like view myself as having a following and just it was like, okay, random person in Pakistan's following me. I'll follow him back. <laughs> right. And then like, they're doing the same thing, you know, like they're walking around Pakistan, like capturing like a window and local madrasa. And then they're capturing, you know, somebody's hands on the street. And, um, so I think early on, it really helped me to, to that my feed was not filled with landscape photography. It was filled with people like that. Mm-hmm that were just capturing the things that they were seeing all around them. And, you know, then I tried to capture the things around that I was seeing around me and, and it didn't look as good as what they were doing. And then that got me to question, well, why, why is my image not as interesting to me as their supposedly captured on the fly image? And then, yeah. you know, then, then that led to a lot of reflection. And then I'm suddenly, you know, crawling on my hands and knees through the forest and then I'm you know <laughs> then I'm wanting to get a new lens and figure that out and so that was kind of my my entree into photography in general and, and I think that's what led to a lot of really interesting photographs that I'm really proud of early on and then later on I think as I started to get more people following me and I don't have a huge number by any means but you know even when I like I crossed over like 2,000 you know I remember like that point and that felt so important to me like oh my god like I follow 500 people and 2,000 follow me. Like, I'm such a big deal. <laughs> then I suddenly felt like pressure. I was like, my followers demand a certain level of photo, which is stupid. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I really intently felt that pressure. And I think that was sort of one of those moments where I moved away from having too much freedom in what I was sharing. I felt a lot of perfectionism mm. that was ridiculous given my level of actual experience and expertise that really mm -hmm. got in the way of my creativity and so it, as i think back on my journey there are these periods you know i could think like specific month blocks where i didn't capture anything that i was particularly proud of and i think it's because i put this artificial pressure to create images that were instagram worthy instead of just documenting the journey as it was and sort of seeing where that took me mm -hmm. And then I would sort of get over it and then get back into the creative and then I'd get pulled back out of it and feel the pressure of Instagram and then pull myself out of it. And so, you know, I, I've, I'm, a, I'm like a recovering addict in that way. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like you can either go too far in one of those two directions in terms of like never thinking any of the work you create is good enough, right? Quote unquote good enough. And then you can also go the other direction where you're not being as mindful in terms of curating your photography and then you end up producing a lot of mediocre photography as well. So it's like there's a there's a balancing act there, I feel like, and that's constantly where I'm struggling because I'm always looking at my images from a trip and I'm like, at first I'm always like, oh, this isn't really all that good. And then I'm like, okay, there's like a handful in here that, I, that I'm pretty happy with. And so it, it's it's okay to not you know, to not be perfect. Right. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. That, oh my gosh, that, that lands, that lands so much, especially like when I'm doing like a seven day backpack or something, then I get to the end. I don't know if you have this feeling on your Colorado trail trip that you were talking about and you do the big download of all the images and you look through and you've got 500 and Oh, <laughs> I don't know, like the initial, the initial or 5,000 or whatever it is that you have. And then like, I don't know, like there's just this like moment where you're like, None of it's good. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and then you actually sit down and look at it and start editing some of it. And it's like, okay, there's yeah. some okay stuff here. Yeah. yeah. Or then, you know, weirdly, sometimes a month or two later, you're like, wow, I'm so thankful I got these three amazing images. Right. But my initial view is always, this is all garbage. I can't believe I spent seven days out in the wilderness and got nothing. What was I doing? <laughs> like, my brain is just so quick to go to that... Uh, judgment self-judgmental place yeah no i'm actually the same way but um i've gotten better over the years in fact i feel like it's a teeter-totter at first i was like everything i photographed was amazing <laughs> and then i went the whole other direction where i come home and it's like uh it's all trash 
And now I'm like somewhere in the middle. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's more healthy, you know, you know, because yeah. it gives you room for growth, but also gives you room to be proud of yourself at the same time. So I think that's probably the more healthy approach is to be somewhere in the middle there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, Tim, I want to go back to kind of your the impetus of your journey. So you lost your job. You put the end to your marriage. You lost your grandma. Your life was obviously flipped upside down. How did traveling alone and photography help you process what was happening in your life? Yeah. I, I think there was a couple of ways. One, one is just getting out of my apartment and getting out of my head. Mm. <laughs> it was really important. The temptation to be overly cerebral is one that I struggle with a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and like the belief that if I think about something deeply enough, I'm going to figure it out. And so I think like the physical act of being in movement was very helpful. I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing that was very helpful was, and I alluded to this earlier, I had a bunch of beliefs about who I was and I had a bunch of beliefs about what other people needed me to be. You know, I, I, I was like a married person. I had this respectable job. I, you know, wasn't someone that took risks. I was dependable and steady. And mm -hmm. I, it was nice to go on a journey where no one knew me, where I didn't need to be any particular thing, where there was this opportunity to just encounter people and encounter places wherever I was in that day. There was just a ton of freedom. I, I set this like intention for myself very early on that I would never talk about what I used to do. Mm -hmm. And I would never ask anybody else what they do professionally. Because mm -hmm. I had felt that to be such a constricting thing for me, like the, the identity of being the business professional. Um, I didn't want to put that on anybody else. And I just thought that took things in really uninteresting directions. So this opportunity to like engage with other people just as another lover of the mountains, as another person who wanted to capture a photograph, as another person who was wandering, you know, the, I, there was just a lot of power in, in being able to meet people in that place. Photographically, I, I think it was helpful to have my worldview focused on capturing my sense of wonder. And I think so much of my life up to that point had been about minimizing risk or making prudent decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so every morning I would wake up in the business world and effectively think, how can I not screw up today? How can I make somebody else happy? <laughs> and suddenly, you know, from this photographic perspective, it was, how can I find something really beautiful? How can I capture it? How can I express it? How can I share it with somebody else? And that's just a very different way of interacting with the world and a very different mind space to be in. And um, so that was very healing. That was very, very healing hmm. to sort of be in that mind space. Um, I mean, I could probably list 20 more things, but that's probably a good, a good place to start. I, I love that you uh, purposely didn't ask people what they do for a living because I, don't, I, I picked it up at a training I went to years ago. But um, one of the things I do now, instead of, you know, someone I meet for the first time, instead of asking them, like, what do you do for work or whatever? I always ask, like, what gets you up in the morning? Right. And that, mm -hmm. that, that just opens the door to so many different answers. And it also throws people off because they're like, well, I haven't really thought about that before, right? <laughs> Which is always revealing like, oh, maybe you should think about that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, totally. And then the other thing I was going to say is um, I thought what you said about being in movement, being really helpful. I found that to be really true when I did the Colorado Trail. I, um, I got lucky enough to run into somebody pretty early on in the trail who had a very similar itinerary as me, and we just got along really well. But she was going through this tumultuous um, experience back home with her ex-fiance, 
who refused to move out of their house. And so, like, he, he was, like, basically forcing himself as a, her roommate in this house that she owned, but they both paid their mortgage on. And so just going on the Colorado Trail and having someone else to just vent to and talk through the situation for her was helpful. And it was I was happy to just be the guy that just kind of listened and offered a little bit of feedback here and there if I could. But I found, you know, as I was doing that journey with her through the Colorado Trail, I could see her demeanor and her personality shift more positively over time because she had the space and the freedom to be able to like set everything else aside and really think about what's important here. And it was helpful to have that space to be able to make better choices. Yeah, definitely. I, I think a lot about uh, early in my journey, I watched the, this will sound random at first, but I promise it's not. Okay. <laughs> the Mr. Rogers documentary. Did you ever watch the Mr. Rogers I, documentary? I don't think I did. Um, oh, go back and watch the Mr. Rogers documentary. Not the Tom Hanks, like, dramatic version of Mr. Rogers' life, but there was a documentary made, I think, in 2018. It's just beautiful. And it, it sent me back, like, really trying to learn about his life. And he, he has this quote... And I'm not going to get it right, but I'll get the substance of it right, which is the greatest gift you can give to another person is give them the space to just share mm. about themselves. Yeah. And he said, you know, for me as a performer, it's, uh, there's a lot of pressure around that because so much of what I'm supposed to do is entertain. So how do I hold the this this knowledge that the way that I can really be of service to others is to give them the space to share and be who all of who they are and also produce content. And I, um, I think about that in like your story, right? Which is like probably the real, one of the real gifts that you gave to this woman that I'm hearing is, and, and nature gave it to her too, right? It's like there was a of container course. that was big enough. You were helping facilitate it, but, mountains were also helping facilitate it for her just to share it. Like you didn't fix her problem, but I'm sure that you were a huge source of comfort and it was a huge gift to be able to give that to her. And, and I experienced that over and over on my journey, you know, whether it was, you know, a mountain landscape or the desert or any number of people that I met who were just willing to sit and listen. Right. That's what made the journey so powerful for me. Was that container being so big? Right. Yeah, I've, I have a lot of questions about your your trip in terms of the, the places you visited. I mean, obviously, you probably got to witness some really amazing scenery and experience some pretty powerful moments in nature. But then I'm also curious if you got to share those moments with some other human beings and whether or not that sharing of the moment made it a more powerful one for you. Or, if, you know, I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the the first night when I went when I got to Colorado, I uh, I stayed with an uncle, and we had a debate about this very topic. Oh. <laughs> he sort of came at me directly, and he's like, "Why are you traveling alone?" He was like, "There's no point to traveling alone." He's like, "I'm 70 years old at this point. I will tell you when I've traveled alone. It's terrible. You know, the only thing that's of value in life is when you can share that experience with someone else." He's like, "That's why I've been." happily married for 50 years like I don't want to go somewhere else if I've gone somewhere else I really want to tell my wife about it afterwards and I was like yeah old man what do you I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> like <laughs> you're crazy I don't believe you're right I want to be alone like I've gone through a bunch of stuff right now I don't feel good about myself like get me the frick away from other people like right. the mountains that's all that I need right. so you know the very next day I find myself up in the great Sand Dune. I don't know if you've been Green Grand Sand Dune National yeah. Park in yeah. Southern Colorado. Stunning. I didn't even know it existed when I was having that conversation with my grandpa. I found out about it at REI, that fateful place where I was setting up my tent. I asked <laughs> the checkout lady, I said, where would you go in Colorado tonight? And she gave me this look like, what do you mean, where would I go in Colorado tonight? I'm like, where would you go in Colorado tonight? And she was like, Great Sand Dunes. Great, I'll go. So I drove to the Great Sand Dunes. <laughs> <laughs> and I climbed to the top of the the great dune like the tallest one mm -hmm. and you know i'm struggling on my own to like get to the top but along the way i, I have all these moments of connection with people mm -hmm. you know that are like kind of funny you know i'm i'm climbing my way up and 
somebody's like coming down on like a sled. I don't know if you've been there before. People take these sleds up and right. like their sled got a little bit out of control and like <laughs> they were like careening down and like almost hit into me and like fall over and then they were just laughing and so then we had this moment of connection over them falling off their sled and somebody else came down and you know was pretending that you know they were gonna die of thirst and we had a good laugh about that and anyway they got up to the top and there's a few other people up there too i thought i was gonna have my moment of solitude and instead you know it's it's a an older woman who's um a photographer and she's with her son who's about my age who is also a photographer and the son is sort of clearly doing landscape where he's capturing like the full dunes and the mountains behind them. And she has her camera like pointed down at the sand. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are you doing? (laughs) And she's like, I'm an abstract photographer. Right. You know, and I had been trying to capture the mountains and I was like, oh, I guess I could try to capture some abstract things. And so I started capturing some abstract moments and, Mm -hmm. and then, you know, the sun's going down. There isn't much of a sunset. So I'm really bummed. I'm like, oh, I expected big red clouds everywhere. Right, of course. Big red clouds. This has been a failure. (laughs) Oh, no. And then, and, uh, but then I like, I I turn and I look uh, to the east and I see there's a full moon rising. Yeah. You know, right out of the mountains, you know, right as I'm bemoaning the lack of a red sky in the west. And then suddenly, like, there's four or five other people with bongo drums, and they're, like, bongoing and, like, singing to the full moon. And, uh, you know, I think for me, like, having that be my first night was such a powerful... uh, It just, like, set the tone for the next two years, which was, I might have my own intentions about what this experience is going to be. And I guarantee it's not going to be that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, whatever I think it's going to be, it's not. And the most joyful moments ended up being these moments of like authentic connection with other people that had nothing to do about who I was. Like these people couldn't have cared anything about me. It didn't matter. It just happened that like I happened to be in the path of the person who was sledding. I happened to be able to be there and connect with someone over not having enough water. I happened to ask someone a question about where their camera was pointed. I was happened to stand near people with their bongo drums. Right. Um, and that was, that ended up being the joy of the journey for me was like having these moments of deep connection with other people. And I didn't stay in touch with any of these people. They didn't become lifelong friends, but we shared this really powerful moment of a full moon rising up over the great sand dunes, me not knowing that was going to happen. Um, and that kind of be, that really became a template for the journey for me was the best moments almost always not always but almost always were random moments of connections with strangers when i was out trying to have my own solitary solo transcendent experience right yeah isn't that funny yeah (laughs) yeah yeah it's interesting because so many of us as landscape and nature photographers are introverts and we don't want to be around other people but what i've always found is while it might not always yield better photography, I always have a much stronger memory of an experience that's from a photography trip when I can connect it to um, something I did with somebody else. Yeah. And I think that's just yeah. how we're wired as humans, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think we're social beings. Right. Um, I think for me, the takeaway from that was I thought I wasn't. You know, because I've been so unhappy for mm-hmm. so many years. And right. I think it, it wasn't that I don't like people. It was that I was interacting with people in the wrong way. Right. You well, know, photography for me, like, became this means of going out into the world in a different way and having a means of connecting with people in a, in a very different way than I had before that ended up being very nurturing. Right. So along those lines, I'm curious... Maybe you can talk a little bit more about your thoughts on photography's ability to authentically help us connect with others. Yeah. I mean, for me, there was... Photography did that in a couple ways. One, early on, I I started keeping a blog. Mm. And actually, most of my focus was on my, my blog and not on my Instagram, which I know is very, you know, 1992, so... No, it's smart is what it is. 
but it, 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 for me, it was pairing the words with the images. Right. And so I really, I really felt this, this urge. I can't even quite explain how intense it was. I mean, it felt primal to share what I was experiencing with other people. Mm-hmm. There's a, I, I grew up a, in a home that was religious. I don't necessarily identify that way anymore, but there's this like idea of evangelism, which is sharing the good news, mm. you know, and that's like coming from God. Like I, it, this world is so good or this truth that I know is so good. I must share the good news with others. And I, I sort of felt that when I was wandering in the parks early on was I need to share this with others. And I found that my words were incapable of sharing just how wonderful this world was. And so photography became my means of trying to share and communicate that with other people. Mm-hmm. So I think that was the, the first piece of it. You know, the second piece was once I, started getting people that I didn't know subscribing to my blog, which was a weird experience. Right. (laughs) Um, And then having uh, people, you know, following me on Instagram that I didn't know and, you know, trying to send me messages or whatever, which is also, I guess now we're used to as a society for me coming from like a very different type of background that was very unusual, you know, back at that point for me, I couldn't quite wrap my brain around it. But like my photography literally was bringing me into communication and connection with other people. Like I put out these images into the world and then people are coming back and they want to say something or they want to speak into your life or they want to connect with you in some way. And mm-hmm. um, I think there's a lot of things that are written negatively about that. But in my experience, it was all, not all, I mean, but mostly all very positive. Right. <laughs> I did have one or two people that turned out to be crazy. I'm sure you have oh, as well. Oh, for sure. That's like... Yeah, but, but but mostly, I mean, I have a, a number of friends who I actually met where I was posting stuff, they were posting stuff. Somehow, I don't even know how, we ended up getting in communication, we ended up photographing something together, and then we stayed close. I have a really good friend, and you're going to have your question later, who do you recommend, uh, this friend named Emily... You know, she and I went and explored Great Basin National Park in Nevada together. And, you know, since then, we've photographed the Grand Tetons. We've been up to Alaska and photographed together. She came down and ran a half marathon with my wife and I two weekends ago. So Instagram also became a source of connection Mm -hmm. in that way. I think, like, the bigger meta question, like, can photography connect people or what do you want to do with your photography i think the hope for my photography was actually to help connect people to the natural world in a different way that was my hope i don't know if i succeed in doing that but i find with instagram there's often a lot of pressure especially now that it's become so focused on reels and videos and attention economy which is very different than what I wanted to do with my photography. But I really wanted to create images and create stories that paired with the images that forced people to slow down and inspire them to go have their own experience in nature. And I hoped that by them having their own experience in nature, that could be transformative for them in their own way. And then selfishly that they would then want to evangelize you know, protecting these spaces and interacting with these spaces in a different way. So I think that's what I... At the root, that's what I really wanted from my photography. Whether I do that or not, I don't know. But that's what the that's what the the deepest longing of my heart is for the, the images that I try to capture. And I'm guessing, you know, for this journey you went on, that focus, for lack of a better word, no pun intended, wasn't necessarily at top of mind for you. But I'm guessing along the journey, you kind of made the realization that that was part of what you wanted to accomplish on your journey. Was there a specific moment where that connection happened or was it a gradual thing that you kind of realized? I think it it emerged slowly over time. I mean, one of the things that's so wonderful, that was such a gift about having this extended time and not having an agenda around the journey, but I wasn't trying to get to all 63 parks when I started. It was more, I'm following the breadcrumbs where they lead was there was enough space and time for like themes to emerge on their own. So photographically, I I look back to my photos recently and I was noticing these patterns that sort of made sense psychologically, which was like for the first 
month I was spending a lot of time, I ended up in the Southwest, you know, into the great, great sand dunes. But then I you know, quickly was, this was like February and March. I was like, I need to get warm. <laughs> get down to the desert. <laughs> right. Time to, time to go to Zion. Uh, so I was spending a bunch of time in Arizona and Utah. And, right. and I noticed I was taking so many pictures of these little junipers and shrubs and pines that were solitary pines in really exposed places where you wouldn't expect life. Mm -hmm. I didn't set out with like a, a vision that like, I'm going to go find something in nature that talks about resilience. You know, in my brain, I, I was looking for something. And I think what I was looking for was this sign or something like, Hey, it's okay. Like you can go on, like you're strong, you can survive. And I, I found in, you know, these, beautiful juniper trees with their long root systems and exposed root systems and growing in these arid places and off of cliff sides. Like, wow, here's, here's a visual metaphor right. of what I'm trying to work through internally. Later on, I, I found similar themes. You know, there was a certain point I ended up in Alaska for three months later that summer. And I was just so drawn to the glaciers and, you know, about the visual metaphor of that. And I think later on, it was really the stars. Mm. And I just kept finding myself photographing stars over and over and over again. And of course, there's like a appeal to astrophotography and there's a, a desire to capture a certain image. But I think at that moment, I was longing for, well, I think there's a sense of longing. There's a sense of wistfulness. There's a sense of loss, like finally coming to terms with some of my grief. And I think capturing that and spending time in the darkness and the stillness of the stars and not actually photographing with other people is what I was longing for and looking to express. So I think in some ways the, the landscapes ended up uh, shaping the photographs that I took, but I also think, you know, what I was going through internally ended up shaping what it was in the landscape that I was drawn to photographically. And then what I wanted to share with other people, even if I wasn't fully conscious of it, I can see the pattern now in retrospect, even if I didn't know it exactly in that moment mm, that's that's awesome so you, you had alluded to a little bit of this earlier but how or if at all did you plan your journey <laughs> yeah there was no plan <laughs> no plan <laughs> at all i mean for the first three months i mean again like i got to colorado i asked the rei clerk where she would go right <laughs> i ended up in the great sand dunes i posted this photo of the great sand dunes i had a this woman who also followed Teju Cole, who was like a professor at the University of uh, Taos or something. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, you're not that far from Taos. You should come down and visit me. So I ended up in Taos. And then when I was in Taos, I ended up going to a, you know, a museum that had um, a woman there who had uh, spent some time in Abiquiu, which is where Georgia O'Keeffe um, had lived and she was like, well, you know, as, as someone who's an artist, you should really go to Abiquiu. And so ended up in Abiquiu and then Albuquerque. And then I was, yeah, it just, it sort of went like that. I really like put this pressure on myself to not plan, mm. which was really wonderful for about a month or two. But then I started <laughs> to expect that I would find the breadcrumb. So then I was going to linger too long. I'm like, well, I haven't found a good enough breadcrumb yet. You know, <laughs> I'd get really mad uh, about that. <laughs> Eventually, I kind of found my way up to Alaska. So I'd started my journey probably in March. And then I think in July, I'd ended up in Alaska. And I ended up there until the end of, or middle of September. And there's a little bit more planning that's required. Right. When you're up in Alaska. And so I had signed up to do a seven-day backpack in Wrangell Elias mm. National Park. And again, I hadn't done that because it was a national park as much as I just heard this was like the most epic place imaginable to go on a backpacking trip. And I don't know. It just, it sort of evolved. I think by the end of that summer though, by the time I left Alaska, I'd gone to like 30 of the 60 parks. Wow. I think that led to this really interesting crossroads moment for me that I actually think back to a lot, which was, I think I had a moment there where I could have gone back to my old work. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, I think people would have said like, wow, you had this wonderful sabbatical and welcome back to the team. And couldn't, I, I psychologically couldn't do it. 
I even I even like signed up to do an interview with another firm, and then I canceled the interview at the last second because just it didn't it didn't feel right. Yeah. But I didn't quite know what to do next. I just knew it didn't feel right, and I think at that point I sort of just, the way that I justified not doing it was well I need to finish this Parks journey. That's good. It, sort of, <laughs> but I think what had made I think I think what had made the first six months so powerful and so transformative was that it wasn't agendaed. Right. That it was just this like open space to explore and see what comes and let the universe meet me where it wants to meet me. And suddenly I was trying to impose this structure on things. And, it, you know, it took me another two years after that point to actually get to all the parks except for one. And, you know, we had this big COVID block in the middle that kind of made things more difficult. And even though I think there was a loss in putting that structure on it, there's also... I feel grateful now that I have this bigger container and that I think it gives me a platform to talk about the parks and talk about photography. Mm -hmm. um, having actually been to all of them except for one, um, but having sort of this contained journey, it, it's, it, it gives me something and it lets me interact with the world and have some sense of authority that I wouldn't otherwise had if I'd ended the journey at just six months. Mm -hmm. And it's not exactly the way that I wanted to live the journey either. So I, I hold both of those at the same time, if that makes sense. It does. And sorry for the boring questions, but I'm just curious. What was your vehicle? Uh, it was different at different times. Oh, you know, okay. Like, I wish I would have had a Sprinter van. I yeah. actually tried to rent a Sprinter van um, on that Colorado. Part of the reason I ended up in Colorado was because I was going to pick up the Sprinter van. Uh, I got an email like two days before I flew down there and you know the guy said, sorry, do you want to like do a different reservation? The one that you were asking me about, I rented it out to someone else. I was like, what, what do you mean you rented it out to someone else? Like I have a ticket to go down there. He's like, well, I sent you paperwork. You never filled out the paperwork. Oh, uh, whoops. I was like, whoops, okay. So, <laughs> so you know, instead I just had to use my own use my own car and sort of make it work. Yeah, what was that? Uh, uh, I just had, like, well, my brother lent me his SUV at one point. Yeah. Um, and I just had, like, a little sedan. So these were not, like, adventure mobiles right. or anything. So you're just car camping. You know, I was doing a lot of car camping. I stayed in a bunch of motels early on before I got like the courage up to actually car camp. The first time I actually successfully car camped was at this place called Alstrom Point. Have yeah. you been to Alstrom Point? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean. Beautiful. I, I wouldn't take a car out there. <laughs> You're right, you shouldn't take a car out there. That's right. <laughs> I got to a point, I don't know how many miles, two, three miles before the end when it, the slick rock gets to be like too intense. And I was like, okay, I'm not going any further than this. And... Um, <laughs> I like hiked in the rest of the way to the point. And of course there's all these adventure vehicles, you know, like the high clearance Jeeps and stuff that are just right. like cruising their way right out to the point. And I'm feeling really mad about that. And, um, I met a guy out there, this guy named Peter who led photography tours and he was taking a bunch of Europeans. Um, and Peter was just like the most Zen man I'd ever met. He was just sort of standing there. He had like his tripod he was like sipping his coffee and his European group that he was with were just running around, you know, like trying to capture everything. And he's just standing very still. And so at first I was running around and then I was drawn to his stillness. Hmm. And so I just sort of sat by him. I wasn't part of his group, but I just sort of sat by him for a while. We just sort of sat there together for 30 minutes. I tried to see like, well, what is he seeing? We ended up having a really beautiful, interesting conversation. And he said, this was at sunset and he said this is beautiful but you should really stay for sunrise and i was like oh, there's no way i can like go find a motel back in page and drive two hours in the dark on this terrible road and right get here by sunrise i realized i had been bringing this silly tent in the back of my trunk now for like over a month <laughs> and i like still was in the box oh okay and i was like i need to take this tent out but i'd never camped before um, and so I set up my tent. I, I didn't even have a sleeping pad. So I barely slept the entire night. I was terrified that I was going to be eaten by a wolf. Of course, there are no wolves 
no. in this area. But like every noise, uh, the first time you're in a tent, you don't know what's happening out there because you can't see. I hadn't like properly staked my tent either because I hadn't really learned about that yet either. So my tent is sort of like flapping like this. Oh, it no. gets down like close to freezing at night. Again, I hadn't, I hadn't sleep an entire minute that whole night. I set my alarm, you know, for 4 a.m. or something and, you know, you wake up and the stars are everywhere. And yeah. Thinking like, why have I not always been doing this? <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. You know, and then I make the pilgrimage out to the to the point, and all the people in their adventure jeeps are waking up and having their nice thermoses of coffee, and they look very rested. And <laughs> um, <laughs> I reconnect with Peter, and you know, he's just so sweet and thrilled to see me again. And he kind of points me to, he's like, you know, my guys are filming over there, but like, you should go over there. Nice. You know, and like, so I go over and I stand over there and I just I had this amazing, amazing experience that morning. Um, there wasn't even good clouds or anything, but it just showed me like, oh, this is what's possible when you camp out here instead of trying to wake up early from the motel and get into the spot. Um, and that yep. was really a pivot point for me in terms of, okay, I actually can car camp. I, I need a pad to sleep on. I need to like be a little bit more comfortable. I need to not be scared that I'm going to be eaten by a wolf or a bear. Um, but that was kind of the beginning of that journey for me. I love it. So looking back on your journey, you know, obviously you didn't plan it out perfectly at all from a photography perspective. In fact, it sounds like there was almost no planning from a no planning. photographic <laughs> perspective, which is highly unusual. Uh, most listeners would be like, oh, that's crazy. But how did that particular approach influence the type of photography you were able to create? I think there was, a, there was an openness to serendipity that I was able to have, especially in that first section of the, of the trip that was very different. I, I ended up going on a, like a photography workshop hmm. later on with this man, John Barclay, who I think you've had on this show. Yeah, John's great. Um, wonderful man and i found that experience to be very frustrating so it's not a, it's not a comment about john but just the, the experience of, of a you know a workshop which is like you and a group of 10 other people all come in your car and are dropped <laughs> off and are told like this spot here five feet in front of the car is really great just wait here for four hours and see what happens <laughs> <laughs> while you're here. John does a great job within that to encourage you like, well, what can you do even within these confines to get something different? Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. And he's a great teacher. Anyone should go on a, a workshop with John. And it was very different than the type of journey that I wanted to have, which is I wanted to be living my journey and I wanted to be creating a story and living a story. And I wanted my photography to be additive or capturing of the story that I was living versus planning my story to capture certain photographs. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Oh, um, totally I think both sense. are really valuable, but that was the journey that I wanted to live at that moment. And so sometimes, you know, I would be like living my journey and I would get to a point that was so beautiful that I would just stop for six hours and try like heck to figure out like is there a small scene here is there a big scene should i wait for the light should i just wait until the stars come out like i don't so like there were plenty of moments of lingering mm -hmm. but i i would find those i would find them instead of planning for them mm -hmm. and yeah it's a, it's a very different way to experience photographs if you have more limited vacation and you're going to one park and you know the five photographs that you want to get and you've studied Instagram and you know those five vantage points, this is not the way to do it. And I would offer up that if you want your photography journey to be more about discovering yourself or interacting with the landscape in a way that's more personally meaningful and connective um, and, and unique... I would offer up, even if you have limited time, let's say you go to Arches, yeah, okay, you know about Delicate Arch, right? But what if you just parked on the side of the road at a parking lot and just started hiking towards some rock outcroppings and see what you could discover, right? And I guarantee, yeah, yeah you might not come home 
with that banger sunset photo of Delicate Arch, but you're probably going to come home with images that nobody else has captured before that are unique to you. Yeah, and I think, you know, you and I had talked a little bit just in our email exchange before about AI, and I think especially... I read some article that there's a trillion images taken a year now. Right. That's a lot. <laughs> and and there's AI. So like the idea that, that you will come up with the best image ever of Yosemite Valley, unlikely. The idea that you can have a really personally meaningful experience and journey on Yosemite Valley and capture an image that always brings you back to that experience much higher. Right. And that's kind of what I, at my best moments... Uh, was trying to do and then there were of course moments where I would get caught up in ego and I would think that I was going to create the the best image of whatever you know right totally tempted by those moments too but you're right like yeah my journey was so many moments of just pulling off on a random side of the road and trying to see what that rock is over there and going over to that rock and having something bizarre happen and maybe getting a great photograph, maybe not, but getting a great story and really holding that story forever and, you know, taking a photograph that maybe other people find compelling or maybe only I find compelling. But either way, like, that's what made the journey worthwhile. I I met a man early on when I I had one of these experiences, which was I went into the Slot Canyon. It was near Page, Arizona. Glen Canyon National Park recreation area if mm-hmm. you've ever been in that area it's just beautiful there's all these slot canyons down there that you can go into and there's typically not that many people but i was very much in my i'm going to photograph everything mindset at that point and i was walking through the slot canyon holding an iphone in one hand holding my dslr in the other <laughs> like going through the slot canyon, and i see a puddle and i'm like so much in a hedonistic consumerist mindset at that point i was like i'm going to jump in the puddle while I'm holding both of this because I'm just like so enjoying the thing. And of course, like you don't know how deep the puddle is. Oh no. So I like jump in the puddle. The puddle turns out to not be like an inch. It turns out to be like a foot. I like twist my ankle. I go flying. Like <laughs> my, I have, a, I have a choice in that moment. Like save the DSLR, or save my iPhone or save my face. Most people would probably save their face. I saved the DSLR. So like ended up going straight down like scraping my chin, like busting my nose, like jamming my iPhone into the mud, but like saving the DSLR like this. And then sitting there on the ground being like, something is not right. This is not, this is not the right way to engage in this experience. Um, and so like putting my phone, putting my phone and my camera away, my phone was busted actually, but like putting them away and just like enjoying the slot canyon, you know, for the rest of the time. And I ended up meeting this couple there that were in their 60s and um having a conversation with them and the the guy said something to me at the end of that conversation which i thought was just so good and so profound he said like at the end of your life like the person who wins is the person that has the best stories and he's like and i'm i am dedicated to beating my wife (laughs) (laughs) i just thought it was the funniest it was the best little interaction there ever and it was it was a great thing for me It was just a great moment for me, too, to remember, like, this is not just about photography. This is not just about, like, checking off some specific hike. Like, this is just about, like, being in these amazing places. And if you capture a great photo of it, that's awesome. If you have a great story to tell, that's even better. And if you can, like, tell a great story through your photo, well, that's the best. But that doesn't always happen, and that's okay. I love that. I'm curious, how has your journey impacted how you approach photography now? I struggle with that because there was like such a sense of freedom and spaciousness on the journey that now that I'm remarried and have a child, I don't have access to that anymore. And so I I, I think I'm still coming to terms with what what creativity looks like or how I want to interact or engage with my creativity now in this much more probably normal, quite frankly, (laughs) but just constrained way of living um and again I've, I've tried to do some of those things like going on this this john barclay workshop you know to try to see is there like a different way that i can interact with the landscapes that would be equally meaningful different but equally meaningful for me and mm-hmm. help me learn new and different skills than the ones i got from just 
messing around, you know, for two years. I don't know. That's still an open question for me. I think there's been a sense of, it's, it's a big change, right? Like having a family brings a lot of big change into your life. And there's things that are really wonderful about that. And I think there are moments where there's a sense of loss and mourning that goes with it hmm. too. And I try to hold on to the truth that like, this is one moment in time. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful in its own way. I don't know what next season brings, but I hope that I hope that photography and creativity is part of it in some way, but I don't yet know how it will be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, though, did for Christmas tell me that I need to get my butt out of the house and go photograph something this spring um, because she's tired of me not photographing. So she's kind enough to do that for me. So I'm already planning, planning something in March, probably in Utah. <clears throat> so you had a... Uh left on this journey in 2019 with the mindset that you were going to be divorcing your then wife, right? Yeah. So then between now and then you've met a new spouse. What was, how did that happen? That happened towards the end of 2019. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Yeah. It, it, for the first four or five months, of my journey, I was determined not to talk to women. <laughs> like it had been such a, you know, it had been such a terrible experience of going through this divorce. And this is not a comment on my ex-wife. I genuinely still deeply love her and really respect her. Like this is not a comment about her, but the experience of going through a divorce is so awful right. that I did not want anything to do with women ever again. You know, like find out a conversation, but like, please keep with, keep, this is before social distancing, but please keep a safe social distance. Right. You know? I'm getting, you're like, I'm and, good. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think by, you know, by the summer or whatever that time was, suddenly I was curious again or longing for that type of connection or interaction with mm -hmm. other people. So I, I had gone to this yoga retreat actually, um, very early in my journey, um, that was out in Sedona and, uh, that had been very meaningful to me early on. I, it kind of gave me some of the confidence that I needed to actually go do this bigger national parks journey. And I think as I got at the end of Alaska, not knowing where am I going, what am I doing? I was like, well, maybe I'll just do another yoga retreat and it will tell me where I'm supposed to go. And uh, <laughs> so I went to this yoga retreat and uh, ended up meeting my now wife at this retreat. And it was not romantic at first. I mean, I think some people you'd expect like, well, you meet somebody at a retreat, it's all steamy and you're making out in corners or something. But that was not our experience at all. It was just, we kept getting paired together on different exercises and then having these really intense conversations. And uh, at the end of it, we sort of like traded numbers. And I don't know if you've ever been on a retreat before, but you sort of trade numbers with people at the end and you think you're gonna stay in touch and then you go back to your normal life and you never talk to them ever again. Um, but for some reason we kept uh, staying in touch and I was going to I was trying to think like where can I go in November to a national park that I haven't been to before that would be worth worth going to and the only places I could think of was I hadn't been through Texas yet mm, okay so Big Bend Guadalupe National Park Carlsbad Caverns which is technically New Mexico but it's right on the border and my wife lives in Austin which is nowhere near those by the way <laughs> but right. it was like <laughs> I was like, well, I can go through Austin on the way to those parks just so I could, you know, like have coffee with you or something. So I, I, I throw this out and, you know, she says, that's a great idea. And then a week later, she sort of called back and said, well, what if I like came out to Big Bend with you? Oh. And I thought, I don't want that. Like when I photograph, I photograph on my own timetable. I don't want another person screwing that up for me. I'm happy to meet people on the trail. I don't want to bring anybody on the trail with me. I don't know if you have this experience photographing or not, but it's, I found it very difficult. Like photographer well, time is especially if they're hard not, to bring other people into, especially if they're not also a photographer. Yeah, exactly. Right. So at first I was like, no, <laughs> yeah, I, <don't> <laughs> I just, no, <laughs> I'm good. And, and, and then there was just a couple of other serendipitous things uh, that sort of happened where I just felt like, I feel like I'm missing a sign here. Like I've been following breadcrumbs 
And this thing keeps like showing up. One of the weirdest was she had had this life changing experience in this place where my mom had also had a life changing experience. So it was sort of on the other side of the world. Nobody knows about it. It's not, it, it just, it was so random. Right. I was like, okay, I'm missing something. I just need to say yes to this. I don't know why. I probably won't get any good photographs, but like, fine. <laughs> right. Maybe this is like the journey that I need to be on right now. And uh, we ended up spending a week out there and some very traumatic things happened to us on that week. One was we saw someone get run over and killed in a oh car. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was just, it was awful. Um, and there were some like, weird things that happened for both of us just like things from our past to like reemerge, like people reaching out that haven't reached out for a long time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anyways so lot, we just were able to lots process to, it lots to process there was just together. a lot to like process and i think in a normal relationship context you'd kind of hide that stuff you know like you hide the messy stuff or you're your best self early on in a relationship right you're like putting your best foot forward and like here like we're literally seeing and processing trauma of an external nature and an internal nature and it's messy and gross and i think we both just felt really or I've, at least i felt really like held and seen in that and that was just very upsetting actually like i left i left both very drawn to her and very upset by that experience because i wasn't ready for my journey to go in that direction yet like mm. i definitely did not want to get into a relationship again and so <laughs> we actually um got to the end of that and you were really debating like should we make this a romantic thing or not like is that safe or not and you know she wanted to and I did not <laughs> I was just too scared and it, it, it really took me until the following fall so almost a whole another year until I was ready to say this is something that I'm willing to explore but you know there was just a period I needed to work through my own feelings about my ex-wife to I think it, up to that point it had been too easy just to like push them aside and now suddenly that there was like another person in my life who was like I, I need to actually process what happened with my ex-wife first and I can't do that while I'm in connection or relationship with another person but like you're coming across my path is what I needed to have happen or need to see to actually do this work of processing it first so that I can figure out like is there another person in my future or not and can I interact with them in a different way Right. And I'm curious, what role did photography play in helping you process some of those moments or feelings for you? And I'm curious if you've noticed, I mean, you spoke earlier about some themes. In retrospect, you look yeah. back and you can see some things. I'm, themes. I'm curious if you've noticed any other themes relating to the processing of some of those other thoughts or feelings. Yeah. I mean, I think during that time <clears throat> when I was in that like discernment, process that got sort of stirred up by having this experience in Big Bend. I really found myself outside alone at night a lot. And I think two of the best images that I've ever taken were during that period. And, and neither one was planned. Um, one was uh, this image of Old Faithful at night. And I tried to photograph Yellowstone on multiple occasions but any success. I don't know if you spent time in Yellowstone or not. Like I just find it to be photographically very challenging. Mm -hmm. If you're a nature photographer perhaps, or if you're like a, a, you know, like you're really good at bison or something like, you know, probably right. it's great. But actually from like a landscape perspective, I don't know. I find it very, very challenging to make compositions that I find to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tried multiple times to, to do that. And I had entered into this period where I was like actively pushing her away. <laughs> like, I don't want communication with you because like you're going to screw up <laughs> thinking about myself. So I was spending a lot of time alone during that period. And I found during the day, Yellowstone's overrun with people. Right. So the only time that I could like get solitude to process anything was at night. So I was spending a bunch of time just like random places in that park at night. Yeah. And so I think there was a certain stillness and a certain groundedness and rootedness almost that, that my images took at that time and this connection to something so much bigger even than the park itself mm -hmm. but it wasn't capturing the park or the geysers I mean I feel like it was it was something about even the smallness of the park in relationship to the sky and and that 
I don't know for me there was there was just like there's a lot of grief in that there was a lot of comfort in that there was a lot of hope in that and it was all mixed in together and I sort of didn't matter like it was so big like I didn't matter anymore I could get myself out of the way in a lot of my images up to that point I had set up tripods you know and then would like run for five minutes to like stand in like the perfect spot to create a sense of scale for my images and at that time as I was processing through I was like I don't want to be in this image right like I, I'm trying to capture something so much bigger than me I don't care if like the scale isn't in it anymore and so um yeah I don't know I don't know if this is answering your question or not but yeah there's just a number of images at that time of the stars in the Milky Way where I felt like I was just able to capture something much digger, bigger, much deeper, and much more personally profound by excising myself out of it, but somehow connecting into a much deeper well of emotion because of that. That makes total sense to me. All right. Well, Tim, I have a couple more questions for you. I know that uh, in our correspondence, you had kind of alluded to a little bit of what I'm just going to label regret in terms of, you know, you went on this huge journey and put yourself in all these amazing places. You, you didn't really plan out any photography necessarily in terms of like, oh, I want to capture this iconic location and this light. And um, I'm curious if you can maybe talk a little bit about that feeling of regret versus looking back and seeing it a little bit differently. I think, I think we've touched on it a lot in this conversation. There's gratitude for the journey. And there I feel an immense amount of gratitude for the journey. And, um, you know, I think it's been, it's been really nice actually to prepare for this conversation and to have the conversation and be reminded of that. And sometimes in the same way that we talked like with Instagram, Sometimes there's this external pressure that I feel to have a portfolio mm. or have like the coffee table book or to have whatever that output is that other people expect or that other people know how to interact with. Right. Um, probably the most frequent comment that I get from people after I tell them about this is, oh, can I buy a coffee table book of your journey? <laughs> And you're like, I don't of all the parks. Have one. And I want to be like, well, you can, but like I only have one image from Pinnacles and that's of a a <laughs> condor and like I, I didn't take any of Hot Springs because I was so angry that it was a park that I just in protest refused to use my camera. <laughs> so I don't know how to do <laughs> So, like, I have I have that tension, I think, where sometimes I feel like the need to, like, oh, this what a, what a missed opportunity to not have this output that other people expect and then can interact with. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine, you know, I didn't set out on this journey to make money off of it. And I imagine if you were, you know, a, a professional photographer whose livelihood was tied up, this would feel much more intense, right? This... I didn't feel that, but there are times in which it would have been nice to make some money. <laughs> sure. You know, and, and so I think figuring that all out sometimes I think brings up some complicated emotions too. So it's a both and, right? It's a mm -hmm. both and. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, hearing you talk, it doesn't sound like you have a whole lot of regret in terms of how you did it. No, I think, I think I did it the right way for me. Mm-hmm. This was the journey that I needed to have. There are lots of other coffee table books of the parks that are wonderful, you know, but this was the journey that I wanted to have. I love that. What advice would you have for someone else who is not able to answer that question right off their head of what would you do if you only had three years to live? Um, I'm happy at my job. What, what would your advice for that person be? I'm a big believer in good questions, not advice giving. Love it. Um, so I think for me, like I, I did talk to a lot of people who wanted to tell me what to do with that time off. Right. You know, like I remember I, I talked to somebody who was like, you need to decide what industry you want to work in and then write a book about it. And that's how you'll <laughs> break into that industry. And 
I'm sure that's true, but like, I don't want to do that, you know, or like, or you just gotta like suck it up and get another job and I don't care if it feels uncomfortable. And it's probably some wisdom in that too. But for me, it was the, uh, the simplicity of that question that stirred up something that I already knew inside myself and that kind of, you know, I needed to do other things to get the courage to actually do it. But it was the first time that I was willing to confront that truth that I already knew deep down. So I think it's a beautiful question. If you're happy with the life that you're living, you're in a job that you love doing and there's no, there's nothing wrong with continuing to do that job for the next three years. I don't like feel like everybody else needs to go on a journey like this. For me, I needed to, but I don't. I don't believe that anybody else needs to follow my journey. I think we all. We all have, you know, like the experiences that are unique and possible to us, and mm. it would be really presumptuous to tell anybody else what those experiences should be for them. Maybe that's the perfect segue for you to talk about your coaching practice. What can our listeners know more about that? Yeah. So I, when I was trying to figure out, well, what does come next after this journey? My now wife is a, a, a wonderful trauma therapist. I know you, you have a psychology background as well. Mm -hmm. um, and my original background uh, before I got pulled into this 10 year detour in business was I had double majored in religion and English literature. So I was really okay. interested in the stories that we tell and the ways that we construct and reinforce meaning in our lives. And you know, through my relationship with her and her just taking me to, I don't even know how many trainings, um, <laughs> she has her own therapy practice where she also, um, you know, uh, supervises other younger therapists and she teaches at various universities too. So she's always like teaching it to me as well. She, she encouraged me to think about, well, can you, can you, bring better questions and healing into communities that you're part of. Don't be a therapist. You're not a therapist. You can't treat mental illness. Mm -hmm. But are there other people who are grappling with questions in their life on how do I make more meaningful choices? How do I live out the decisions that I want to make with more confidence? How do I interact with other people in a new way than the way that I seem to be trapped continuing to interact with them. Can you speak to those communities? Can you work with those people using, you know, your own experience and all these therapy tools that I'm going to teach you? And that's kind of what I've been up to now since uh, the middle of 2020. So, you know, almost three and a half years now. And so I've been doing that, started just with individuals. Um, and this past year I've expanded and now I'm working with a lot of couples as well, which mm. I found to be really, really meaningful. Mm. I think especially having gone through a divorce mm -hmm. and then having to work through, like, I'm not going to solve your marriage for you. Like, right. I can't like, can't work through my stuff through you. Right. But like, can I help facilitate a space, a container in the same way that parks were my container that's big enough for the two of you to be able to say things to each other that you haven't before and be able to have more clarity about what you need to do next. So yeah, it's been really interesting and really powerful work. I'd love at some point I have this vision, I don't quite know how to pull it off, of bringing photography into that. I don't know quite how to do it. I don't know if it's like a if it's retreats or something, I've, I've been somewhat resistant to having a photo retreat because I'm not, I don't have that engineer's mind. I can't tell you exactly like what happens to light diffraction and what's going to happen with if you use this lens versus this lens to your bokeh effect. And, you know, I, I can't do that. Um, but I think I can encourage people hopefully to interact with the landscapes around them in a different way mm -hmm. that brings them present to what's happening internally and then hopefully be able to help them process what's happening internally so maybe when my daughter is a little bit older i'll have the space to kind of bring those two things together maybe you and i will do it together i don't know but i i hold on to that as kind of a dream someday of something that i'll be able to create no i think there's a lot of value in that concept and it's actually it's an idea that I <clears throat> explored a little bit just like on you know the back of a notepad in terms of like what would they even look like and how do you market that and but I do think combining photography and coaching whether you know it doesn't have to be coaching about 
photography stuff. It can be coaching around like something that's happening in your life, like you're talking about. But I think pairing those two things together can be a very interesting combination. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right, Tim. Well, yeah. my last question. Uh, who do you recommend for the podcast? Who are some people we should learn more about? Um, have you had Chris Burkhardt on this podcast? Uh, I have not. I've reached out a few times. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess he's probably like such a big, big deal now. He's busy and stuff. I, I, only, I had a very strange encounter with him early on my travels, which is the only reason I sort of bring him up. And maybe someday he'll he'll show up on your podcast at exactly the right moment. Um, but the other person I'd recommend is uh, Emily Salstrom, who I'd mentioned earlier in this podcast, who has one of the most interesting life stories of anyone that I've ever met. I don't want to share that, you know, without her permission of sharing her life story. But I'll just say she has one of the most interesting life stories of anyone that I've ever met. We met through Instagram, ended up going on this trip to Nevada or meeting up in Nevada together and then uh, going to a bunch of different places. She's really interesting to me, not only because her photographs are beautiful, which they really are, uh, but two reasons. One, her, her philosophy of photography is entirely different than mine. So we've been on a number of seven day packing trips together now, like three or four, and she will regularly take two photographs on the entire trip. <laughs> so she'll bring, you know, like a tripod and her camera. She will be lugging the thing around seven days through the wilderness. And it will be somewhere and I'll be like, this is so beautiful. And I'm getting out my camera and setting up the stuff. And she's just sitting there and doing her thing. And I'm like, aren't you going to take a photograph? She's like, no. Nah. But then, you know, there'll be that one or two moments, literally one or two moments. And she'll take it and it'll be unbelievably beautiful. I'm the take 3,000 images per day kind of guy in contrast. <laughs> But the other thing that's really interesting is she's a computer scientist by training, and mm. she created this app called My Sunset. I don't know if you know this app or not. Uh, if not, you should check out My Sunset. And she figured out a way to scrape uh, all the information from the like public weather sources in America, pulls it in, ties it into your geolocation, and then gives you a probability that you will get color in the clouds mm at sunset and sunrise, wherever you happen to be standing. That's and it'll give cool. you the forecast over the next seven days. You know, in a way, obviously only an engineer right. could do. Uh, it sort of goes against like my philosophy of serendipity and discovery <laughs> what it, whatever you see and like standing <laughs> on the mountaintop, like wondering, it's a gray sky now, will the sun break through or not? So it goes kind of against my philosophy in that way. But I think for a lot of people that are looking for great photography apps, my Sunset and Photo Pills are really the only two photography apps that I keep on my phone. Love it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Tim, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and your time with us. I really learned a lot and appreciate um, you just being vulnerable and, and sharing with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you to Tim for opening up and sharing your journey with us. I personally found it to be such an inspiring story, and I can tell that you'd be a great coach for anyone else finding themselves stuck in their current situation. I hope to see more of your great photography on social media and to continue to connect with you. That is probably the number one thing that I love the most about hosting this podcast. I get to genuinely connect with real humans on an intimate level and learn from your wisdom. Here's a hearty thank you to all of our amazing guests for sharing their incredible journeys with us. If you haven't seen it yet, I've created a most valuable podcast page on my website, which showcases the, the episodes our executive producers have chosen to showcase to the public as the episodes that they are most proud to have financially supported. Executive producers are anyone who has contributed at least $500 to the podcast on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, or a combination of all three. I picked $500 because it's roughly my cost to produce each episode of the show. For each $500, you get an executive producer credit, which allows you to tell the world which episodes of the podcast 
you think are the ones people should tune into first. Thanks for everyone who has already submitted theirs and for everyone supporting the podcast at such generous levels over the past six years. You're all so incredible. If you too would like to gain an executive producer credit, you can join as a member on Patreon or make a one-time donation to the podcast. Thanks in advance for helping keep the show afloat. Cheers. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.